Good evening, and thank you for joining us for the 14th and the last session in our series entitled, It's Not About Me. Now, in this session, our theme will be Upward Thinking, and it's pretty much a worship session. Now, as we come to a close of our series, I want to use this last chance to encourage and exhort you to keep your mind on God, to keep your mind on the things that are above to keep on striving to have a biblical and high view of God and who He is. I want to encourage and exhort you to keep on thinking about God and His plan and purpose for this world. Remember the truth that we started off with in the very first session, namely, God does not exist to make a big deal out of us. We exist to make a big deal out of God. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's all about Him. You and I can never think too much of God or too much about God. You can never have a too high view of God. And you can never claim that you have spent enough time or wasted time in thinking about Him. And so, for the last time in this series, let us heed the words of Hosea 6 verse 3 that says, Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. Let us behold our God through upward thinking, and may it result in, in our lives bring more and more glory to God as we become like the one whom we behold. As 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18 says, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And so, let us watch the following video from R.C. Sprout and then please pause the video and answer the startup questions. If God is slow to anger and patient, excuse me, since God is slow to anger, <laughs> we're always learning. Since God is slow to anger and patient, then why, when man first sinned, was his wrath? and punishment so severe and long-lasting. Time out. <laughs> Didn't we just have that question a second ago? We did. Yeah, it's a little, I think a little, we little did. Nuance. That God's punishment for Adam was so severe. This creature from the dirt defied the everlasting holy God. After that, God had said, the day that you shall eat of it, you shall surely die. And instead of dying, Thanatos, that day, he lived another day and was clothed in his nakedness by pure grace and had the consequences of a curse applied for quite some time, but the worst curse would come upon the one who seduced him, whose head would be crushed by the seed of the woman. And the punishment was too severe? What's wrong with you people? I'm serious. I mean, this is what's wrong with the Christian church today. We don't know who God is, and we don't know who we are. The question is, the question is, why wasn't it infinitely more severe? If we have any understanding of our sin and any understanding of who God is, that's the question, isn't it? As we then deal with the theme of upward thinking, I want to encourage you to think upon three things about God, namely, think upon His holiness, think upon His supremacies, and think upon His sufficiency to save. And so, in the first place, think upon His holiness. Think upon His holiness. In a previous session, we looked at Isaiah 6 verse 1 to 8, but I want to direct our attention to that passage again tonight. In Isaiah 6, verse 1 to 8, we read the following. 
In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was full of smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongues from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and whom shall go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. Isaiah had a vision of the Lord in his majesty and splendor and holiness. The holiness of God is the focus of what the seraphim are saying to one another in verse 3, where we read, where they say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Remember that for God to be holy means that God is separated from sin and separated from this world. He is completely other than this world and there is nothing that he can even start to compare with him. And he is completely perfect. He is light and there is no darkness in him at all. God is not tempted by sin. He doesn't tempt anyone with sin and he cannot look at sin in any approving way. Here is the reality. Seeing God in his holiness will always then lead to being convicted about our own sinfulness. Because that is what happened with Isaiah, um, as we see here in verse 5. As he saw the holiness of the Lord, verse 5, he says, And I said, Woe is me, um, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Seeing God in His holiness helps us to see and understand um, how deserving we are of His judgment and wrath. But then Isaiah experiences the unthinkable um, and amazing mercy and grace of God in verse 6 and 7, where he said, And then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongues from the altar. And he touched my lip, mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And the three times holy God extends forgiveness and atonement to a wicked and corrupt sinner. He takes away his guilt and pardon, pardon him. Um, simply put, he doesn't die, but instead God grants him mercy and life. And then we find a response from Isaiah on the question of God in verse 8, where God asks, Whom shall I send and whom will go for us? And Isaiah answers, um, according to what is the only logical response by saying, here I am, send me. And this is the Old Testament version of Romans 12 verse 1, if you'd like, where Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you will present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable worship or your spiritual worship. You see, it works like this. The higher your view of God is in His holiness, the lower will be your view of man in his sin. The greater will be your gratitude and worship of Him for His mercy and grace and forgiveness. And the more eager you will be to proclaim Him to the glory of His name. If you want to fulfill your purpose in glorifying God in this world, think much and think deeply upon His holiness. In the year.
year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, the whole earth is full of his glory. In the second place, think upon his supremacy. Think upon his supremacy. In Colossians 1 verse 16, we read, For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. This verse, Colossians 1 verse 16, form part of uh, a passage of revealing the supremacy of Christ, namely that He is exalted over everyone and everything. In Colossians 1 verse 15 and verse 17 to 19, the, the verses surrounding this verse we read, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body. The church, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Now these verses clearly teach us that Jesus is God. And verse 16 teaches us about Jesus' relation with creation. Uh, where it says, For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, with the thrones or the means or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. 
In this verse, it uses three presuppositional phrases, namely, by him, through him, and for him. Verse 16 starts by saying that by him all things were created. You see, Jesus is the source of everything that exists. It is his power that brought everything into existence. He is the efficient cause of why there came, came something from nothing. This is so because Jesus is God. Note that all things were created by him. All things physical, spiritual, as well as all authorities and rulers. This brings the great assurance that Jesus has authority and control over everyone and everything, even the fallen angels and the devil himself. But this verse 16 then continues to say that all things were created through him. Jesus is the agent through whom everything was made. He did it. He is the one who made everything and gave it its life and existence. He is the word that the Father has spoken. You would do well to remember in John 1 verse 1, John starts his gospel by saying this about Jesus. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And in verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. But then also, um, note the last two words of verse 16, namely, for him. You see, Jesus is the goal of the universe. All things exist for him. You and I are part of the all things. And in this truth, we find the answer to one of the most important questions that anyone can ask. Namely, why do I exist? What is the purpose of my existence? You see, you exist for him, for Jesus. Meaning, you exist for his pleasure. That he might delight in you. And that you might bring him joy. You exist also for his service. That you might worship him and do the things that he commands us as the Lord. Also, you exist ultimately for his glory. That he might reveal his perfections and greatness through you and put himself on display. The question then tonight are, are you fulfilling the purpose for your existence? Are you living a life? Where you are pleasing Him and serving Him and bringing Him glory. This is then ultimately um, why Jesus came to die on the cross. For we have sinned. We have missed the mark of pleasing and serving and glorifying Him. Remember Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So He, Jesus, our Creator, became one of us, His creatures. So that he can buy us back from the penalty we deserve for this failure. Namely, death. As Romans 6.23, the beginning says, For the wages of sin is death. And Jesus came and he, and he came to buy us back so that he can restore us to our purpose of pleasing and serving and glorifying him. He did this so that we would be zealous, passionate and devoted. In the good works that he has prepared for us, as Titus 2 verse 14 and Ephesians 2 verse, 6, uh, 2 verse 10 rather, um, says, You see, let us think upon the, his supremacy and let us know that he is worthy of all of our worship and praise now and for all eternity.
In the last place then, let us think upon His sufficiency to save. Think upon His sufficiency to save. Hebrews 12 verse 1 and 2 uh, is such encouraging, encouraging verses. Listen to what it says. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and, and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The Christian life is nothing less than a race of faith. And in this race, we are called upon to run this race with endurance. We are called to keep on keeping on. And specifically, we are to keep on turning away from sin and anything else that can be a hindrance in our lives. And we are to keep on trusting and believing in Jesus. We are to keep on thinking upon His sufficiency to save. That is indeed the key and secret. 
to running this race with endurance and reaching the finish line. Namely, we are to keep on looking to Jesus, as Hebrews 12 states. We are to look to Jesus and think upon His sufficiency to save from these three points of views. Number one, look back to the cross of Jesus. Jesus is the one who endured the cross, says verse 2, for everyone who would look to Him. Jesus is the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of those who would trust in Him alone. He came to die the death that they deserved, to bring about the complete forgiveness of all their sins, past, present, and future. Through the death of Jesus Christ, sinners like us can be reconciled to God, can be accepted by Him, and have peace with Him, all based on the, based on the performance of Jesus and the death of Jesus in our place. Looking back to the cross of Jesus helps us to remember that through faith in Jesus, we have been accepted by God, and that there is nothing left for us to do to be made right with Him. Romans 8 verse 1 states it so wonderfully, namely, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus our Lord. So look back to the cross of Christ, but also look up to Jesus at the right hand of God. Jesus Christ is right now seated at the right hand of the throne of God, as Hebrews 12 verse 2 states. He is the one who ascended into heaven after his resurrection. And he is now enthroned as the King of Kings. And all authority has been given to him. He is the sovereign ruler over everything, which includes your life and my life. Look up and know that he is in complete control of everything that is happening in your life. So that you can know that all things work together for good, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. As Romans 8 verse 28 so wonderfully states, He also is, he is also the one who is interceding for every one of his followers. Hebrews 7 verse 24 5 gives us the assurance that he is able to therefore save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to, to make intercession for them. He truly is the founder and perfecter of our faith. Look up and know that you are not alone, but Jesus cares for you and is interceding for you as you are running this race of faith. Look back, look up, and look forward to the return of Jesus. Jesus endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. Again, verse 2 of Hebrews 12 states, There is also a joy set before us as well, namely the return of Jesus and eternity with Him. We need to look forward and remember that this world is not it, but that as we already love and enjoy Jesus now in knowing Him, worshipping Him, and serving Him, the day is coming that we will see Him face to face and where we will love Him with an unsinning heart as we spend eternity with Him in the new heaven and the new earth, namely heaven. We need to look forward and remember that for the Christian, the best is always yet to come. Don't give up in the race of faith, but keep on looking forward, knowing that, as Hebrews 10 verse 36 states, we need, to, we need endurance. So that when we have done the will of God, we may receive what is promised. Therefore, look back, look up, and look forward as you think upon His sufficiency to save. Turn your eyes upon Jesus.
As we then close this session and come to an end of our series, I pray and hope that you have grown in your understanding that everything in your life and my life is about God and not about us. I pray that you will not only be instructed about this, but convicted and converted to live for the glory of His name in every area of your life, now more than ever before. May we always remember that 
We exist to give honor to His name. And therefore, may we have no higher goal than to see someone think more highly of our Father and our King. Revelation 4 verse 11 declares, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Amen.
King, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore Him. Let's close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, what a joy it has been to go through this series and be reminded week after week that it's not about us, it is all about you. And I pray, Father, help us to practice upward thinking. Help us to think deeply upon your holiness. Help us to think daily upon your supremacy. And help us to think regularly and about your sufficiency to save. That we will keep on looking to Jesus on what he achieved for us on the cross, that you will keep on looking to Christ and know that he is now at the right hand, your right hand, Father, and he is supreme over everything. He is the ruler, the king of kings, and we will keep on looking forward, knowing that the best is truly yet to come. Help us to keep our minds on you, to keep on thinking on the things that are above as we pilgrimage through this world. Because then, as we see your holiness, as we see our sinfulness, as we see your supremacy, your grace, your mercy, we will be grateful to who you are and that you saved us. And we will be propelled. We will be um, con convicted and converted to live a life of showing forth your mercy, your grace, your glory. Please have your way in us. And may you be glorified through our lives. We pray this, Jesus Christ, to the glory of your name. Amen.